everybody. Hank Linderman, welcome to Getting Angry. It's August 6th, Thursday. Good to see you all here. I see, gosh, we've got a lot of the regulars are already here, and uh, you're already asking to share. That's a wonderful thing. We've got a, a great guest today. In fact, we've got uh, uh, Dr. Greg Adams is going to be here. Let's hear his theme music. Greg Adams, good Dr. Adams, ask Dr. Greg. So, Dr. Greg's going to be here very shortly. I just got off the phone with him. He's raring to go. But uh, so let's just start digging into the business we got to deal with first. Uh, this is going to be great, and I'm so glad you all are here. Uh, as you know, this is getting angry, and of course, we don't want to act like damn fools just because we're angry. We want to use that to focus ourselves to be able to do the thing that our country needs, the thing that the state of Kentucky needs, the state, uh, the things that the world needs. We've got problems that we've got to face that we are avoiding. So uh, I'm so glad you're here. Uh, this is uh, going to be something. Uh, let's start with these terrible numbers. Um, of course, you can see right there. Um, uh, actually, I did that wrong. Let me do that. To, let me try that again. Uh, let's do it this way. There we go. Now I get to be in the corner up here, which I like. Um, so the bad news is, again, our death rate is high. We've dropped down our number of cases. They're fluctuating all over the place. But look at that, still uh, 55,148 new cases, 1,311 new deaths. Bear in mind that the nation of South Korea, for their entire time with the virus, uh, they've had 300 deaths, maybe a little bit more. And um, they're a nation of uh, about 50 million people, 51 million people. So if they multiply that by seven and you get the size of the United States. So it would be something like us having 2,000 or maybe even 3,000 deaths. Look at us, we're at 161,601 deaths, most of which did not need to happen. And that's all because of a failure of leadership inside the United States. Uh, let's go on, and uh, we're looking at the states right there. Notice that Texas is still number one in new cases. Number one in deaths today is Florida. Uh, looks like Florida's gotten their cases a little bit better under control. And again, there's only so much trust you can put in any particular set of numbers from any particular day. You kind of have to look at them over time, but what we're seeing is they're not finished. I see um, uh, Mary says she can't hear anything, but I think the rest of you are hearing things. So Mary, you might have to hit a switch. Everybody please remember to share, of course. Okay, so we're back to the states. So there's Kentucky right in the middle. Kentucky still is holding its own, but still 544 new cases. I got to say, I went to the grocery store this week and I wore, uh, I wore my mask when I was uh, at, the, at the grocery store. And as I walked in, there was a big sign that said, you must wear a mask, face covering, you must cover your, um, you know, your mouth and your nose. And right in front of me, someone walked in in front of me without a mask and with a little bit of attitude. No mask, plenty of attitude. And uh, I asked the guy guarding the door, wearing a mask, you can't do anything about it. And they're not going to do anything about it because people are so uh, triggered, I guess, about it. But uh, anyway, big story today about the NRA, the National Rifle Association, which, of course, has been uh, the most successful lobbying group related to uh, uh, getting laws passed and also protecting uh, the Second Amendment, I mean, to the point of almost extreme. Well, there, it's the biggest story, and you notice we're at Memorandum. Memorandum is a website that is nothing more than the hit parade for political stories. So when you see something at the top, it just means more people are reading that story. And I, I went ahead and took the, uh, the, the picture from that number one story from NPR. Uh, the New York Attorney General has moved to dissolve the NRI, NRA after fraud investigation. And let's just read just a little bit of this. The NRA's influence has been so powerful that the organization went unchecked for decades while top executives funneled millions of dollars into their pockets. By the way, if you're an, if you're an NRA member, you know, if I'm an NRA member, I'm got to be pretty upset that they've been taking this money and, you know, fueling a, you know, a ridiculous lifestyle. Um, 
the NRA is fraught with fraud and abuse, which is why today we seek to dissolve. They're looking to dissolve the NRA because no organization is above the law. You know, the NRA is a nonprofit, and the idea that they're using their nonprofit status to make themselves wealthy. Uh, they charged uh, Wayne LaPierre, who you all have probably heard of, but additional people too, the general counsel, John Frazier, former CFO, Woody Phillips, and former chief of staff, Joshua Powell. I don't know if you remember a few years ago, who was it? There was someone who had been uh, a role model for the NRA who kind of got into a kerfuffle with them. Uh, they gave $54 million in contributions uh, to the GOP in 2016. In fact, they sent something out uh, in favor of... Um, they sent something out in favor of my opponent, Brett Guthrie, and... Uh, now, wait just a damn minute. I agree. That's, uh, that's Chris Cabali. Uh, but they said something like, only he would protect your rights to guns. And we'll talk about guns someday. But anyway, there were a list of alleged... Uh, financial malfeasance, including the use of NRA funds for vacations, private jets, and expensive meals. Uh, Prosecutor uh, Attorney General James's office said that the charitable organization's executives, quote, instituted a culture of self-dealing, mismanagement, and negligent oversight that contributed to the waste and loss of millions in assets. I think they lost just a tremendous amount of money. Uh, Billy says they've put him in Facebook jail again. Bill, we got some. Uh, I've got a solution for you. So everybody, you're gonna have to pick it up here and, and share things because uh, we want Dr. Greg to be well represented. Uh, let's let's see if we can get Dr. Greg on the phone. I'm gonna call him right now. Let's see if he'll pick up. Uh-oh. Not sure what's going on. Dr. Greg? Greg Adams. Good Dr. Adams. Ask Dr. Greg. Oh, it says he's un unavailable. Let me try him one more time. This happens. Hello? There you go. We had a, a misfire on the first time I tried to call you. I am here. How are things in Kentucky? The things are great in Kentucky. It's actually beautiful weather. And um, uh, I got to go out for a bike ride today, Dr. Greg, because I, believe it or not, I work on these get-togethers for several hours before we do them. And we had had a bunch of rain this week, so I didn't get many, uh, I didn't get many times to exercise. And uh, it was good to get out this morning. But let's dig into it, because I, I wanted to talk to you about hydroxychloroquine. Can you, before yes. we, and you, you and I have discussed a list of things we're going to go over, but can you tell us what hydroxychloroquine is, first of all? What kind of medication is it? It's a, it's a medication that we've, we've known about for almost 75 years now. Uh, we use it for, uh, for diseases that are autoimmune-type diseases or inflammatory-type diseases. Um, it's used routinely in lupus. Um, it's used routinely in prophylaxis to prevent catching uh, malaria, for example. Um, it is a, uh, a drug that was used early on in the, the COVID epidemic, pandemic, because they found uh, some evidence in the Petri dish in the laboratory that it may be effective. And that's usually how those stories start. Hey, it looks like it may work in the laboratory. Let's find out whether or not it works out there in public. And the, a couple of studies came out that showed that there was some benefit. But when we did the, the controlled studies, when we really looked at it seriously, it didn't have any particular benefits in COVID patients. Right. Okay. Well, there's a whole, of course, controversy that we're having to deal with. So I guess I'm going to start to dig into the questions that we talked about. So the first one is, does politics play a role in a physician's decision-making process? Uh, the, it's, it's a good question. Every human being, physicians included,
included, um, carry their politics with them and it affects decisions that they make. I mean, the obvious one is who they may vote for or whether or not they are going to choose to boycott a particular product. Um, a physician, when he chooses to use a medication that may be effective or not effective on a patient, um, does not use politics to make that decision. So if I have a medication that I know you will benefit from, I actually put my license uh, in peril by withholding that from you. Well, that's that seems clear enough. You're going to use the science, and you're going to use what you've learned and experienced um, to choose what medication is correct for your patient. Absolutely. All right. So, number two, if I'm a patient and I show up, and I've heard that hydroxychloroquine might be good, right, that that might be good for me to try for if I show up with whatever illness I've got and I ask you for a specific medication, can I demand that from you? Can, can my family ask if I'm incapacitated? So, yes, you could always ask. The, the issue is that, that I still am bound by what information I know as to whether or not a medication is effective. So imagine if you were a car mechanic and you brought your Toyota into the car mechanic, and you said, I think my Toyota would work better if you used Camaro clutches or Corvette headlights. And your mechanic would say, that doesn't work here. We have to use things that are effective for what you have. Um, when someone comes in with a, a disease, and I know that there are effective medications or treatments, and there are medications that are not effective, you get no benefit, I get no benefit by prescribing a medication that doesn't work. So that means that the messaging, when we're getting messaging from politicians about medications, we've really got to take them with a grain of salt. I think so. I think that you ought to use the same tools that we use to make a decision of whether or not a medication has effectiveness in a disease. The, the problem, I think, is getting muddied because there are physicians who are touting hydrochloroquine as a, uh, not just a treatment but a cure. And as you dig into their background, you find the, the unfortunate um, example of the woman who, who was associated with saying that hydroxychloroquine is a cure, is a physician and a minister. And then she got associated with all sorts of very bizarre, erroneous, other sorts of thoughts, um, which was dreadful that she said, use this medication. It's also dreadful to say that there are doctors out there that you, you have to assess whether or not they're telling the truth, whether or not they're, they have some other agenda uh, involved. So I have to go back and look at all of the studies and say, what, how, do we, how do we assess this? How does medicine assess whether or not a drug is good or bad in any given scenario? Because well, it's confusing. You just brought up studies, and there have been supposedly, I think there were some studies. There was one out of France early on. Was that uh, Didier? Was that his name? Uh, yes. Uh, that seemed to, it made it appear that hydroxychloroquine was effective. Correct. Uh, and this is how any good idea gets started. It gets started in the laboratory. Hydrochloroquine had some benefit in, in stopping the virus in a Petri dish. And so you say, all right, let's try it in people. And in, uh, in very sick people, there was some early data that was very encouraging. But the way we look at data is we say, okay, so that's, this study has this limitation. It, it didn't look at a control group who did not receive the medication, or this didn't have enough uh, patients in it to really make that sort of statement. And so you wait for a bigger study that has properly controlled and shows clear benefit. And uh, we call it a prospective study where we actually start the day saying the next patient that comes in does or doesn't get hydrochloroquine. And then you use those data as they become more and more available. The, the problem is, that the early studies then get disproven by the bigger, better controlled studies. And then you have to say, oh, well, I guess that's not going to be an effective way to use this medication. 
And even um, Dr. Fauci was a believer at the very beginning, but as the data came in, he finally looked at the data and said in late July, we know that every single good study, and by that he means a study that was randomized and controlled in which the data were firm and believable, has since shown that hydrochloroquine is not effective in the treatment of COVID-19. So is that, as far as medical science is concerned, that's the end, the answer as far as hydroxychloroquine goes, right? For, for now. For the, now. Um, okay. And, and uh, the other component of this is this is a time of great uncertainty. This is a time of great fear. I think that it's normal and um, completely human to say, I want to be sure of something. I want to I I find something that I can hang my hat on. Right. And hydrochloroquine was something we thought we could hang our hat on early on, and then we find out, no, that's another piece of shifting sand, and it makes us feel more unsure. Hydro, uh, hydroxychloroquine is a great medication for some, some diseases. Now, now, it also sounds like there's a possibility that in the future, you might find that hydroxychloroquine combined with something else might be effective. Yes, 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 yes. And so we just keep looking at it. Okay. So the, the next question is, how did this get to be political? Was it political to begin with, or do we simply not know about this medication? How did this become something? It, it, you know, before this, I didn't know how to say this word, but now I know how to say hydroxychloroquine, and I think the rest of the United States does as well. So how did this get political? Uh, it, it became political when politicians started making recommendations for medication. Right. Now it's a political thing. Uh, if uh, and uh, uh, President Trump does not call me for <laughs> advice. Every time we say Trump, I have to play the Wilhelm scream. So outstanding. Uh, <laughs> he does not call me for uh, advice on politics and governance, and I don't call him for advice on medicine. Uh, you you want to leave the the experts dealing with what they're experts in. When politicians start recommending medication, you begin to think that there may be other motivations behind that. I don't know what those motivations are. I don't know if it's money. I don't know if it's control. I don't know if it's simply uh, a, a, an attempt to divert attention away from other things that we should be paying attention to. Yes. Well, it may also be wishful thinking. You know. I, I like wishful thinking. Now that, and that's all, all, every scientist that studies this has that wishful thought. I hope this works. Right. We all want this to go away. Uh, next is, why is any study not conclusive? When is a study conclusive? Uh, and we talked a little bit about that um, when we talked about the different types of studies. When you first think that it would be interesting to study a medication, you have an idea that it may be effective because of some piece of information. Someone used it and there was a good outcome. And you think, wow, maybe that'll be an interesting thing to study. And uh, the way that they would have done it initially is to say, um, we looked at 50 people who had COVID and what treatment seemed to do better? Well, these guys seem to receive this medication. Let's study and see if that medication works. And then you do a different type of study prospective, meaning that you make a decision to do the study and go forward with it rather than looking at data from behind. And then randomized, meaning that someone comes in, patient A gets the drug, patient B doesn't get the drug, and there's not a difference between the two patients. It's just how the, the, the drug is distributed is based on a random a randomization protocol. And then you have to control it. You have to make sure that the people who get the drug and the population of people that don't get the drug are equal, that they're equivalent, that you can compare the two. And then you look at those data. As you begin to do more and more complex types of planning for the study, prospective, randomized, um, double blind, so the doctors don't even know who gets the medication and who doesn't get the medication. And then you look at those data, that becomes increasingly robust. That becomes increasingly more um, uh, valid in terms of, of information. And then someone's got to come back and repeat that experiment. I was going to say, if, if the, the experiment can be repeated and it gets the same result, then that indicates more, more uh, it's a more solid uh, result, isn't it, if you can repeat it? 
Absolutely. And it's one of the requirements. If you're going to come up with a new chemotherapy drug, it has to be repeatable by another laboratory. Another word you often hear said is uh, a multi-center study, meaning that not only is the study done in my hospital, but it's done at Mayo Clinic and it's done at Sloan Kettering and it's done in other uh, hospitals using the same protocols. And then all of those data are glommed together. And that adds, again, more valid, uh, more validity and more robustness to those data. I'm going to combine the next two questions that we've got because that way I won't have to push the, the button so often. But um, the, president's, uh, uh, the president is promoting this without conclusive scientific proof. Why is he doing it? Why are his supporters promoting it? And is this a Democratic conspiracy to sabotage Trump's reelection campaign? I, I, I would dearly uh, love to think that the Democrats were um, that organized and that devious, but oh, we're not. Oh, that's funny. That... Now wait <laughs> just a damn minute. <laughs> that's Chris Cabali, you know, objecting to your criticism of a Democrat right there. <laughs> I, uh, we, we want good things for people. We don't want to sabotage Of course. Of course. Uh, why is Trump hanging on to it? Uh, I don't think Trump get diverted from his beliefs by data, by truth. I think that uh, whatever it is that he is benefiting from, he is going to continue to push that so that he benefits from. When the, the United States has a stockpile of this medication, we have over 31 million pills of hydrochloroquine that are stored and ready for use. Um, so part of this being pushing this drug, maybe saying well, we've already, you know, stockpiled this drug, we have to use it. Now, he doesn't benefit from the medications having been purchased because they weren't. They were, most of these were actually donated. He may benefit from the distribution of this drug to various people. And uh, his friends benefited from the distribution of masks and of ventilators when there was such a problem early on in this disease. They had the ventilators, and then they distributed them, and there were uh, he created techniques to distribute these where it was almost like an eBay bidding war for ventilators. You know, I'm, I'm realizing also, besides the ventilators, there was another issue about this. Um, uh, of course, we, he ended up with states competing against each other to be able to get uh, personal protection equipment. Um and uh, you're saying that possibly friends of his were involved in they might benefit from distributing hydroxychloroquine? Correct. The, there was a great NPR uh, report that dug into how the PPE, the personal protective equipment, and the ventilators were distributed across the country. And what they found was layer after layer after layer of uh, companies that were benefiting and profiting from the distribution of the of the, that equipment. Wow! So each layer takes a slice. Exactly. They 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 get a little bit of they get a little bit of sugar each time that it moves through them. You know, I wondered about that related to testing, and we haven't talked about that ahead of time. But early on, uh, uh, the CDC refused the working test that the WHO had. Wasn't that correct? Uh, they did. Um, the the testing part was problematic in a couple of different ways. The original test was a very complex test and only a handful of labs could do it well. And it was going to be expensive. We wouldn't be able to ramp it up very quickly. And so part of the problem was the, the realistic doing the test was going to be problematic. The other problem was, and um, Trump even said it when the cruise ship came by and people had COVID on the cruise ship, he didn't want that cruise ship to land on the United States because then the United States would own those positives. He didn't want any positives. He seemed to be focused on the wrong side of the problem there. I think so. Uh, maybe the perception. So do doctors get kickbacks from pharmaceutical companies for prescribing medications? Oh, gosh, what a great question. Uh, and this is, there are movies that talk about this. The, there used to be a problem with kickbacks. There used to be a problem with the use of one medication or one product over another. And it was not necessarily dollars in someone's pocket, but it may be a trip to an exotic place or a, a dinner for you and your family. Uh, that 
has all been abolished um, as of, uh, well, it was only as recently as 2010 with wow. laws called Sunshine Laws, which essentially every pharmaceutical company and every medical device company has to say, I this, this money went to this physician or went to this program. And so there are laws now that protect the consumer from physicians and pharmaceutical companies or medical device companies being in collusion. Well, I'm glad to hear that there's been some cleanup on that. Um, I also know human nature, and I expect that companies that are selling medical products and and uh, they find ways to get around to circumvent whatever the rules are. Um, just my suspicion. I and and I, I I don't think that that's a bad suspicion. I can tell you that it uh, the the sunshine laws affected not just how corporations had to report to the government. It also affects how federal dollars are spent on hospitals. And so a hospital, if they hire physicians, have to have policies in place where no gifts are received, no junkets are taken, no meals are delivered from uh, pharmaceutical corporations. And in fact, they've taken physicians out of negotiation committees and decision-making processes where one drug or one device may be chosen, that hospital. So we all want this pandemic to end. We, we want to get better faster. I mean, everybody's getting really sick of this. You know, this, uh, we, we want society to open. We want to be able to open businesses. We're trying to open schools. And so far, that's uh, going uh, disastrously. Um, is there any advantage for a doctor to withhold a medication that they know will make a patient better? I can't imagine that. Why would a doctor? No, no there's, there, there's no advantage. The, okay. If you have a medication in your armamentarium, and you know it's going to work for a particular patient or a particular disease, you are, it's not just honor bound. It's not just the right thing to do. You, you actually have a, a legal responsibility to make that available to them. Right. Okay. So, you know, you're fulfilling your oath. You know, what is it? First, do no harm. Yes. And, and basically to help us be healthy, help us get better. Uh, uh, we have a question in the comments actually from my wife, and she says, what is Dr. Gregg's opinion of TV advertising of drugs? Ah, interesting. Yeah, that, and that's been around for a long time. Yeah. The, uh, all that is is an advertisement looking for patients from a pharmaceutical corporation. So there's no doctor who wants this to happen because all of those commercials end with ask your doctor. Right. Uh, which means that someone's going to come in and say, I heard about this drug. Do I have this disease? They're shopping for people who may have a symptom. And if they have a symptom, they know that they're going to increase their population of people that may benefit from that drug, whatever it is they're selling. And right. so while I'm all for the education of the population, um, they're not advertising that you should do better testing your blood sugar so that you can keep your diabetes under control. They're saying, take my drug to keep your, your, um, your diabetes under control. So it's always based on whether or not they can get more customers. I don't mind that someone is now thinking about depression or someone's now thinking about hair loss or someone's thinking about whatever it is that they're advertising. I like the idea that they can come to me and I can fill in the rest of the gaps of that conversation. So that's helpful. It's just that we don't do that for all diseases. We only do that for the ones we have drugs for. And it does seem that pharmaceutical companies are focused on treatment more than prevention or even cure. Absolutely. Well, cure is good. Um, if someone had a cure for cancer, that would be one of the more famous pharmaceutical corporations around. Um, the, but treatment is the, that's the, um, the golden fleece. If you take a drug every day for the rest of your life and that drug costs five dollars that's dollars and cents in the pharmaceutical company's pocket and i think that that prevention becomes a feature of single payer systems quite a bit um, absolutely we don't focus that much on prevention other than if you as a as a an individual will decide that you're going to work to um uh, you know, you're going to work to stay healthy in the food that you choose to eat and so on, getting enough sleep, doing things to keep yourself healthy, uh, stopping smoking uh, uh, and so on. But 
that's not really been the purview of doctors because they're not encouraged to do it. It uh, almost embarrassingly so. So if you were an internist, who was taking care of someone with diabetes is a good example where you have to see them frequently. You have to do make sure that they're taking their medications appropriately and you'll get paid a salary for a family practitioner and a very small amount for each of those visits. It's not reimbursed well. Now, right. should that patient have a complication where they develop blindness or kidney failure or circulatory problems or heart disease, then in walks a different specialist who gets paid much more to take care of the complications of diabetes than the family practitioner would ever get paid to take care of the prevention of those complications. I believe it was the Michael Moore movie that um, uh, they interviewed doctors in the United Kingdom. And these doctors were, they were driving nice cars. They lived in nice houses and they were getting bonuses for getting their patients to quit smoking or getting them to lose 15 pounds, that kind of thing. That resulted in them getting paid more. Right. If you, well, I, I would hope that physicians were in that science for other reasons than getting paid well. It, it does need to be incentivized, and it's not currently incentivized in the United States. Well, there comes a point that the amount of money becomes... Uh, you know, I was looking at the salaries of uh, somebody who started at the NRA, started with a quarter of a million dollars, but then within a few years was up to $800,000. And it's a name you've never heard of, but he was a functionary at the NRA, and there was so much money floating around that that can affect anyone's judgment, I would think. Uh, Bill McNichol asks, what are your thoughts on a single-payer system, or is it... Uh, uh, is there uh, is that an entirely new and different episode? It might be. Maybe we should talk about single payer some other time. But uh, I, I, I think it, I, I'm a, a huge fan of it because I think that get, people ought to be healthy and we ought to do prevention and that's the way to do it. Uh, but there's so many uh, there are so many forces that are opposed to it uh, who are taking money out of the, the the kitty before it actually gets deployed to taking care of patients. Right. You know, another subject, I, I, you know, there's good news, by the way, everybody who's listening, uh, Dr. Greg is going to be uh, trying to be with us uh, once a week is what we're aiming for. And uh, one of the other subjects we're going to be discussing is addiction. Uh, if you were listening yesterday, uh, we had a comment uh, from a gentleman whose son had overdosed the night before. And, you know, it's a tragic thing and it's a tragic issue throughout the country, but very much so here in Kentucky. And we are not dealing with addiction very well, but that will be another episode. And Dr. Greg, thank you so much for giving us your time and your wisdom. We really appreciate it. And um, uh, I, I'm glad you like your theme song. Randell and Luann, thank you for doing that. Um, you said your family members were pleased with the theme song. Yeah, uh, yes, uh, I, I am. I'm still trying to to put this in perspective. You know, I've always tried to be um, a respectable human being and a, a competent physician, and I never thought that having theme music went along with that. But I guess it does. <laughs> well, that's so great. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> and we will talk to you next week. And thank you so much. I'm going to play your theme music on your way out, and then say goodbye to everybody. All right. Thank you, and thank you for what you're doing, Hank. This is wonderful. Oh, I, I appreciate your help. Thank you. Greg Adams, good Dr. Adams, ask Dr. Greg. All right, that's going to be it for us today. Um, I'm going to say goodbye to you all. Thank you for being here. This is Getting Angry. Remember, you don't want to be a damn fool just because you get angry. We want to do the right thing. We'll see you tomorrow, 2.30 Central, 3.30 Eastern, for Getting Angry. And we're going to have... Uh, we're going to have an interesting guest tomorrow, and I'll give you some information about that. But uh, Andy Gamblin's going to be on. Andy Gamblin from Owensboro is going to talk to us. All right. Thank you all so much. Appreciate it.